Hello, my name is Thomas. Welcome to British Culture Albion Never Dies, the podcast that asks what is Britishness. And of course, one thing that can uncover what is Britishness is looking at how British culture intersects with other cultures. If you're listening in the week of release, Xing and Kuala, Happy Chinese New Year, or as many British Chinese would say Gong Shi Fa Chai, because of course one is in Mandarin and one is in Cantonese, and Britain has a particular link to uh, old Canton province, particularly Hong Kong. That's something I'll be talking about. And of course, growing up in the UK, I lived in a rural and semi-rural parts of the UK. It was not the most ethnically diverse part of Britain, but you always had a few. Uh, you always had a few Hong Kongese around. Um, there was Hong Kong boy at school and so on. My grandfather, not often given to talk about the past, um, did talk to me sometimes about his childhood, um, particularly in Hong Kong. Actually, although he spent more of his uh, childhood in then British India, uh, but he remembered particularly the Victoria Harbour and the clock tower there that I'd later see as an adult. Because of course, to make this podcast episode all the more interesting for you. I spent six years living in China for that and for no other reason. <laughs> 2024 is, of course, the year of the dragon, which in Mandarin is long. So a friend in China message me, it's going to be a long year. <laughs> and uh, as I said, if you're listening a week of release, I've been to a Chinese New Year party. It's been really, really interesting around here. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing all about this. If you are interested in uh, learning a bit about Chinese culture, then I'd just like to take this opportunity, aside from recommending my own YouTube channel, where recently I've been talking more and more about uh, my family history, um, that's on youtube.com forward slash British culture. There's also a YouTube channel I'd like to recommend called Electric Shadows. And so far there's just three three film reviews, Rebels of the Neon God, Sujo River, Days of Being Wild. And uh, these are kind of social realism uh, films. I think that's the way I would describe them. I'm not sure if the content creator would describe them just like that. And if you listen to it, then you may uh, you may recognize the voice. It is my friend. Kane, who of course gave me the deep dive into tea, and we've done a number of deep dives together, uh, back when I was doing really long form uh, podcast. He is a bit more of an expert on China than I feel I am. I, I just spent six years there, but he spent ten, ten. Uh, so perhaps first of all, I'll talk about this. I, I do have a long connection with China, um, but I always feel not quite enough to consider myself an expert. So why? Why? As you may know, as a teenager, I learned Turkish. I was living in Turkish Cyprus. I lived there for seven years. I became very much a Turkish specialist. And um, obviously, it's a very, very niche language. And I was very conscious of what a niche it was. So when I went to university, well, I'd already been reading some Chinese history. I took courses as part of my first degree in Chinese history and Chinese language. Um, so I did actually study the Chinese language at university um, to a fairly low level, to be fair. I do have some qualifications in Chinese. Um, and then I was looking for jobs in China and ended up working in the Middle East instead. Later on, I came back to the UK and I felt my time abroad was enough. I just wanted to live in the UK, work a normal job. So I didn't apply, but I ended up being headhunted uh, for a company that was operating in China. It was a Swedish company in China. I uh, worked there for kind of a year as a worker and then became uh, a manager for the next five years. And it was a Swedish company operating there. And the teams that I managed um, were mixed. So it could be Brits, Americans, New Zealanders, and uh, Chinese. And the Chinese could be from, from Hunan, from Canton, from you know Inner Mongolia, all over the place. So, of course, these people, well, obviously the Chinese speak better Chinese than I do, but a lot of the teams that I managed were Western people who... You know, they didn't study a bit of Chinese at university. They totally, totally studied Chinese. Their degree was Chinese linguistics and so on. And they'd always wanted to live in China. And they, maybe they'd been learning it since they were a kid. And I used to ask them, what, so what do you do on the weekends? And I watch a Chinese movie and I heard a Chinese book and I listened to a Chinese podcast. And I had other interests. You know, I might watch a Bond film or I might read a Turkish book or do something else. So I was managing a team of like real dedicated Sinologists. Um, I frankly have a lot of other interests going on. So among my social circle, um, I would say I was not necessarily the greatest Sinologist. So that's why I have a long connection to China, but I don't always feel um, 
that I'm a true, true expert. But I know people who are. So I'm actually going to lean on uh, Kane for this. Kane, uh, when we were in China, he had a social, social media thing going on on the Chinese internet called Kingdom of Culture. And although I looked for a few places to find out who was the first Chinese man in Britain, I kind of like his the best, to be honest. Um, so the, uh, the first Chinese man in Britain uh, was Shen Fu Song. So who was he? He was a Chinese government official who converted to Christianity, travelled to Rome to meet the Pope, and then travelled to set foot in Britain. And when was this? It's in 1685 that he stepped foot in Britain, which is much longer ago than I think most British people would realise. I think most British people would imagine, you know, 19th century as the first contact, but it actually is further back than that. In fact, he visited Oxford University, taught Chinese, arranged their Chinese language section, which apparently no one else could understand, and taught Chinese to a famous British Orientalist, Thomas Hyde. What a great name, Thomas. He also met King James, as in the King James Bible fella. Um, he met King James, who was so impressed by uh, Shen Fu Song that uh, he commissioned the only picture of him that still exists and is now in Windsor Castle. So this Chinese man, uh, this Chinese Christian, remained in Britain for three years before setting out for his native China via Portugal, but sadly died in 1691, never quite making the trip back home. So that's the first Chinese man to land in Britain. I found that really interesting. As I say, the 19th century is when most of us would kind of start to be aware of a Chinese community, even if it's just from Sherlock Holmes, where there's reference to the Chinatowns and so on, and opium dens, which I'll get into more later. And uh, again, leaning on my friend Kane, the first Chinese medical doctor who trained in Britain, that is, uh, Wu Tingfeng, was in 1855, 30 years later, a British Chinese lawyer. So they've been, uh, let's say, part of professional British life um, for a bit longer than most people would assume. Recently I've been watching the uh, the old TV show Praro, Praro, which is a, a TV show that went from 1989 to 2013 and one of them, an episode written by David Renwick, um, was set in kind of maybe 1920s or 30s London's Chinatown um, and it's a really good portrayal. It's an episode called The Lost Mine and one of the Chaps might seem a bit familiar, Vincent Wong, because um, I know a lot of listeners are Bond fans, and Vincent Wong was General Lee in Die Another Day, and has been uh, an extra in a whole bunch, which is probably most recognisable, because he was Colonel Sun in the original uh, book cover. But yeah, I say he's been an extra in, I think, six other Bond films, and Die Another Day is which he's best known for. But I like the David Renwick Chinatown episode, because um, this writer is particularly famous for penning Jonathan Creek, uh, which I'd recommend. He's, this writer has a particular eye for oddities and eccentricities, so it was uh, an eccentric and interesting episode set in, uh, well, Chinatown in London a hundred years ago. But, but, first contact. Well, I suppose the first contact for me is uh, the kind of the concessions that we have in uh, Canton City, now known as Guangzhou. When I first went to Shenzhen, I was kind of curious. Obviously, I know all about Hong Kong, but before before Hong Kong became British, uh, most of the traders were at uh, Xiamen Island or Xiamen, depending again on whether you're going with Mandarin or Cantonese. Um, but but this little place in a city further up uh, the Pearl River uh, is where the kind of original European concessions were. And so when I went, rather than looking up like a modern, you know, rough guides or something like that, I actually kind of went quickly onto Wikipedia and downloaded a map of these concessions from the 1920s. Um, I took a more modern guide, so I worked out how to get there. Uh, I think I stayed in a hotel in uh, Guangzhou, uh, taking a fast train from Shenzhen. And then kind of slowly made my way there. And it was kind of interesting because you have the main city of uh, Guangzhou, which is much older than Shenzhen. Shenzhen is the modern tech city. You know, it didn't exist 30 years ago, not rarely. I mean, there were a few fishing villages and all that kind of thing. But the modern, vibrant city is a very modern creation, whereas Guangzhou is a much older creation. And the Europeans were allowed on uh, basically a little island. Xiamen means sandy surface. So it was probably just a little sand bank slowly being uh, shored up. And you have to access it from like a just a short little bridge. It's not so many metres long. 
Um, and then it was divided into two between the British and the French uh, by the Qing government uh, in the early 19th century. And it's really interesting. It's a lovely little island. There's lots of little trees, old colonial buildings. Um, and of course, many of them have been turned now into a, a modern Starbucks. It's a perfect place to go and take a few, take a few cute photos and the British district uh, there's two bridges one for the British and one for the French and the British bridge uh, apparently used to have Sikh soldiers brought over especially from India uh, to guard it and it's very very small it's kind of as an area of 0.3 square kilometers 900 meters east to west 300 meters north to south um, and this is uh, originally originally where the traders were so you have all these old warehouses and official uh, official buildings um, and it's a very, very cute place to visit. But this was an early, early European concession, kind of preceding the First Opium War, which is, uh, the modern Chinese government would say that the First Opium War starts Chinese century of humiliation, the time when China started to be humbled by the West, which I find interesting, because at the time, the emperors really didn't consider it all that important. Uh, there were internal rebellions that were considered much more important. The, the Chinese dynasty at the time was nearing its end and of course Chinese dynasties always have the mandate of heaven, the Chinese emperors, the you know, emperor of heaven and earth and all that. Um, but when they start to lose control it's often seen as a, a sign that they're losing their mandate. So the fact that he was perceived to be losing his mandate of heaven uh, was actually seen as uh, much more important at the time. But in the modern modern uh, discussions it's the European concessions that get all the fuss and attention now if only I had just done a podcast episode on my top five books about the British Empire and two of them had covered this well what do you know I did last week and my favourite one was Lawrence James The Rise and Fall of the British Empire chapter five they little know our strength, the Far East and the Pacific. This is quite a long section I'm going to read, but I think it's really interesting. As I say, Lawrence James basically just tells the facts, and I do like that, so I'll be chipping in myself. Chapter 5, They Little Know Our Strength. Claydon House in Buckinghamshire contains a Chinese room embellished in a style which brings together Chinese and Rococo motifs. It was created in the 1760s when men of discrimination looked on China with awe and wonder. It was an ancient, orderly civilization whose artifacts, particularly porcelain, were prized by collectors and imitated by craftsmen like those employed at Claydon. Chinese tea imported by the East India Company was well on the way to becoming a daily palliative for all classes. Within 80 years, attitudes to China had changed radically. A popular encyclopedia published in 1842 said little on Chinese civilizations, but instead described China as an unbounded mart, with a population clamoring for British goods. These were denied them by their rulers, who refused to recognize the benefits of free trade and has gone as far to exclude British commerce. By the way, just chipping in here, that I keep referring to Chinese civilizations, plural, rather than Chinese civilization, singular, which just reflects my uh, experience in China coming across Cantonese, Hunanese, Fujianese, and so on and so on, and discovering so much of the different cultures within it. One of my favorite things about living in China is that I would always hear people say, oh, Chinese food in China is so different from Britain or so different from America. But of course, Britain has a huge Cantonese population so and has had an influence on Hong Kong, so actually I can get Cantonese food here pretty easily, and I've been to Cantonese restaurants that serve pretty much exactly what I'd have in Hong Kong. There's differences in, for example, vegetables that grow here are different from the vegetables that grow there, and importing vegetables, you know, they can be a bit different when they're transported and so on, but broadly speaking, it's the same dishes. However, people from Britain who go to, say, Beijing or Shanghai they have very different uh, food experiences because, of course, China is vast and has many different cultures within it. It's a bit like a Chinese person saying, oh, I went to an Italian restaurant, and then when I went to Norway, the food was completely different. Well, of course it is. It's a vast place. <laughs> anyway, that's why I keep uh, pluralizing, which uh, Lawrence James, uh, I don't think, does here. Anyway, Lawrence James continues, Opium 
rather than manufactured goods was what the British sorry what the Chinese people demanded. The fallacious combination of British taste for tea, which the Chinese for opium had been exploited by the East India Company, which since 1773 had enjoyed a monopoly over the drug's production. The rise of the opium trade coincided with a period of Chinese decline. I referenced that earlier. By 1800, China had become a static, introverted society governed by an intensely conservative and ossified bureaucracy. Yeah, you see, that mandate is slipping. The Qing dynasty of emperors were Manchus, outsiders, who found it hard to rally their Chinese subjects at moments of crisis. Again, that thing about multiple civilizations. But rulers and ruled were united by a common mistrust of all foreigners, who they designated barbarians, and treated with condescension. This had been amply demonstrated in 1793 and 1816 when two British missions, headed by Lord McCartney and Amherst, had travelled to Peking in an attempt to establish formal diplomatic relations between Britain and China. Both embassies were politely cold-shouldered and departed in no doubt that they had been regarded as representatives of some distant tributary state. Again, I'll chip in here. That kind of fits with Chinese history, with uh, whichever city has been the capital at the time, regarding closer states as their natural subjects. And the further and further away you go, well, naturally, the less and less civilised they are. And they should come and give some kind of tribute. The Chinese word for China is, of course, Donghua, which is middle kingdom, because they are the centre of the universe. We do talk about sometimes how we in the West are so ethnocentric. It's not unique to us. And, of course, we describe ourselves as West because we are West of Jerusalem, um, that being our centre of the universe. Given Chinese insularity and apprehension of all things alien, it was inevitable that a clash would occur with Britain, which believed it had a right to conduct unrestricted trade throughout the world. The first collision occurred in the spring of 1839 at Canton, the main port open to foreign commerce, as I mentioned earlier. The uh, Chinese imperial government, disturbed by the harmful social and economic consequence of opium addiction, decided, addiction, decided to curtail the trade and instruct Commissioner Lin Si Hu to cut it off at its source, Canton, now Guangzhou. The measures provoked an angry response from Captain Charles Elliot, the superintendent of trade, and when news of them reached London, the government came under pressure from companies with Chinese interests. Lin's behaviour was represented as another example of Chinese obstructiveness and a direct challenge to the principles of free trade. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Parson, therefore authorised the dispatch of a seaborne expeditionary force to the mouth of the Canton River. Today, the First Opium War, 1839-42, to is commonly portrayed as a shameful act of aggression contrived to promote a trade which was immoral and to which the Chinese government had rightfully taken exception. Contemporaries regarded the war and its successors as highly praiseworthy enterprises undertaken as a final resort. The fault lay with the Chinese who had formerly connived at the trade, and at the same time treating Britain and its merchants in a high-handed manner. The war was therefore seen as a showdown in which Britain and its patience exhausted revealed its muscle in the hope that after a chastened Chinese government would prove more amenable to perfectly reasonable demands, the war was a severe shock to the Chinese, who knew nothing of the technology of their adversaries. I shall leave Lawrence James there. That's chapter 5. They little know our strength from the rise and fall of the British Empire. I do find it interesting, of course, he doesn't delve too deeply into the Chinese side of the story because his focus is on the British Empire, and that's a, a broad enough, broad enough topic to cover. And again, he talks about how it was perceived at the time, which I find interesting in the contrast with how it's seen now as kind of a, a shameful aspect of our history. And again, when I was recommending the, the top books on the British Empire, the second favourite was Niall Ferguson, Empire, How Britain Made the Modern World, because he has a more analytical side. It's a lot shorter, it's a lot more, a lot less detailed, and it's a lot more analytical. He does talk uh, about the Opium Wars, but he mixes it in with another subject, the slave trade, and a more general idea of British naval power. So I'll read a, a shorter section from Niall Ferguson's Empire, How Britain Made the Modern World, and the chapter is entitled Heaven's Breed. If Britain wished to abolish the slave trade, starting with a different topic, they simply sent the navy. 
By 1840, no fewer than 425 slave ships had been intercepted by the Royal Navy off the West African coast and escorted, escorted to Sierra Leone, where nearly all of them were condemned. A total of 30 warships were engaged in this international policing operation. If the British wished the Brazilians to follow their example by abolishing the slave trade, they simply sent a gunboat. That's what Lord Palmerston did in 1848. By September 1850, Brazil had passed a law to abolish the trade. If the British wished to force the Chinese to open their ports to British trade, not least exports of Indian opium, they could once again send the navy. The opium wars of 1841 and 1856 were, of course, about much more than opium. The Illustrated London News portrayed the 1841 wars of crusade to introduce the benefits of free trade to yet another benighted oriental despotism, whilst the Treaty of Nankin, which ended the conflict, made no explicit reference to opium. Likewise, the Second Opium Opium War, sometimes known as the Arrow War, after the ship that was the Causus Belli, was fought partly to uphold British pe prestige as an end to itself, just as the ports of Greece had been blockaded in 1850 because a Gibraltar-born Jew claimed his rights as a British subject had been infringed by the Greek authorities. Yet, it is very hard to believe the Opium Wars would have been fought if exports of opium prohibited by the Chinese authorities after 1821 had not been so crucial to the finances of British rule in India. The only real benefit of acquiring Hong Kong as a result of the war in 1841 was that it provided firms like Jardine Matheson with a base for their opium smuggling operation. It is indeed one of the richer ironies of the Victorian value system that the same navy that was deployed to abolish the slave trade was also active in expanding the narcotics trade. Again, a few different issues mixed in there, but I do do enjoy Niall Ferguson's take. And again, both of them don't really touch on this fact that uh, this conflict was very much Britain, as well as France and America, coming in at the end of the, uh, what Kipling refers to as the dynasty. <laughs> the dynasties were being weakened by their own internal struggles, which Britain would get very, very active. And of course, uh, my recommended rabbit hole, which I haven't done for a while, my recommended rabbit hole would be Chinese Gordon, also known as Gordon of Khartoum, but Chinese Gordon was his uh, original nickname. So let's get broadly into how Hong Kong became British, which again, it, it, and that's, that would be a secondary rabbit hole for me, but of course Hong Kong flourished. It had been a series of uh, fishing villages. It did have that natural harbour, Victoria Harbour. But Hong Kong, under British administration, really did flourish. Its GDP becoming greater than that of the whole of China, especially as China became under, I wouldn't say, more strict <laughs> communist rule than we might later say. I'm going to move away from history into the more cultural side of this, which is, of course, Hong Kong had two things, money, and freedom, and that resulted in a phenomenal film industry that's that's famous all over the world, and of course was uh, very much the incubator for a young uh, Bruce Lee, who was born in San Francisco, and his parents were there on a business trip, um, but he moved to British Hong Kong when he was four months old, and he later claimed U.S. citizenship, so is often classified as uh, as a Chinese American, but his upbringing was very much in British. Hong Kong, and that's where he was introduced to the Hong Kong film industry as a child actor by his father. And of course, later on, would uh, be tutored by Ip Man, who is now uh, a film legend um, himself. Interestingly, his maternal grandmother was actually English, the grandfather being uh, Cantonese. Hong Kong was, of course, handed over in 1997, and one of the more vocal voices has been the last governor of Hong Kong. Generally, the governors of Hong Kong were career diplomats, not exclusively. Some had been politicians, but Chris Patton was uh, a cabinet minister um, who then became governor of Hong Kong. And as a very active frontline politician, he went about things in, uh, well, an active frontline politician role. For example, wearing a business suit instead of the traditional colonial uniform. That's one that's often uh, taken as kind of a signal for how he approached it differently. And he has, uh, you know, after 1997, he kept relatively quiet. He kept himself to himself, feeling that his time was over. But in more recent years, especially uh, from 2020, when there was the new Hong Kong national security law, he described it as absolutely outrageous, accused the Chinese Communist Party of seeking to destroy Hong Kong, and has also criticised the British government, saying that they shouldn't see trade as a reason to avoid condemning uh, laws that restrict basic freedoms, freedom of speech, and so on. 
and uh, he says we keep kidding ourselves that unless we do everything China wants we'll somehow miss out on a great trading opportunity and that's drivel um, so he's become more and more vocal he is an interesting man to man to look up for the bond nuts <laughs> the bond aficionados uh, Hong Kong has appeared uh, what three times in the bond films and the handover was something discussed uh, a great deal. Lots of initial drafts of the movie Tomorrow Never Dies were going to be about the handover, but of course it would have dated the film um, immensely. And in the literary Bond world, uh, Raymond Benson's book Zero Minus Ten is all about the Hong Kong handover. I reviewed it on my YouTube channel, um, and, spoiler alert, I loved it. I thought it was really, really good. Um, so yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed the book Zero Minus Ten. So that's all about uh, Bond and Hong Kong. But the movie guys, they've obviously discussed this more and more. Um, and in the movie Skyfall, some of the backstory of the villain, Silver, is that he had been caught spying against the Chinese and he was kind of handed over to them in exchange for six other agents and, quote, a peaceful transition. Um, so it's kind of obviously had been discussed uh, from the early 90s and finally uh, got into the 2012 film. I talk about a few prominent um, Ch Chinese British actors. Burke Kwok, Burke Kwok is uh, my favourite, hands down my favourite British Chinese actor in the 1960s. It did seem like he was the only one in the Pink Panther. Of course, he played Kato. Uh, he works for Goldfinger in the movie of that name. He plays Mr. Lee, and he works for Blofeld in You Only Live Twice. He's Spectre Number Three. I do like this idea that Burke Kwok goes from one villain to another. Of course, he was the villainous character in Tenko, um, Prisoner of War film, and uh, like all great British performers, when it was time to seek uh, retirement, he went on the long-running British comedy Last of the Summer Wine, which is all about retirees in Yorkshire. I believe Buck Cock was born in Lancashire. Anyway, uh, he, he played a fantastic character, Mr. Entwistle, the electrician, Entwistle Electrix, and had a great uh, introduction as uh, you know, he's the first uh, non-white uh, major cast member and so we see him driving around and the characters kind of noticing him and eventually he goes up to the main characters and says I come from the east I come from Hull in East Yorkshire and all the West Yorkshire now oh, I thought there was something different about you <laughs> he has a great comedy um, art uh, so he was Harry Hill's number two Harry Hill introduces Burke Kwok as his brother and he was like, I know what you're thinking. You couldn't tell the difference between us. And he was also the voice in the uh, the game show Pastiche, Banzai, uh, showcasing his comedy talents. On a more serious side, we have David Yip, uh, who was the first British Chinese actor to lead like a good major TV series. He played a detective who was Chinese, and so they called the TV show The Chinese Detective. <laughs> it was a very highly rated um, show. He was born in Liverpool to a Chinese father, seaman from Hong, Hong Kong, Canton, and uh, an English mother from Liverpool, uh, one of eight children. Very working class upbringing. He starred in The Chinese Detective, and uh, oh, he then broke into films. His first one was Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. He's, uh, he plays Jones's past companion, Wu Han, and uh, of course then gets into the James Bond universe as Chuck Lee, CIA. <laughs> I like that he plays a straight-up American. The first British-Chinese member of Parliament was Alan Mack, and he was elected in uh, 2015, I think, and it was interesting, he's a Conservative member of Parliament. In a pre-election interview with Hong Kong's South China Morning Post, which you see in Tomorrow Never Die, so I can never resist buying it when I was there. But anyway, in an interview with Hong Kong's South China Morning Post, he was keen to downplay it, actually, and said, this is modern Britain, having a Chinese-looking person stand for Parliament, becoming an MP is not a story, it's no big deal. Um, and in fact, his uh, parents were originally from rural Guangdong, probably been around there. Uh, so he was the first, first kind of Chinese-British member of the Commons, um, and more recently he's been in the MOD as a minister and now the Treasury. Anywhere. We also have Nathaniel Mingyan Wei, who is now Baron Wei, um, born 1977, the year of The Spy Who Loved Me, and Star Wars, um, and Bridge Too Far, and is also known as Nat Wei, so he's an English social entrepreneur, advisor on technology, uh, the first British-born person of Hong Kong origin to become a member of the House of Lords, 
He also sits as a Conservative and was the youngest member of the House of Lords when he first became a Lord in 2010. I think uh, someone younger joined in 2016, but his parents are from Zhongshan, which is the other side of the Pearl River from Hong Kong and Shenzhen. And yes, yes, I've been there too. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little village. Only four and a half million people. Um, <laughs> most famous for Zhongshan Old Town, uh, which is... Uh, kind of a colonial period, treaty port style buildings from the 1920s and uh, there's a couple of major streets with all these 1920s buildings that looks absolutely fantastic. It's quite a lot of local tourism and there's also a massive pagoda built in uh, 1608, seven storeys high. There's a Sun Yat Sen memorial close by so it's uh, actually a good tourism place. So if I ever meet Baron Way I can say, I know your parents' hometown, it's, it's kind of a cool place. Probably probably the name that was, uh, I looked up a bunch of British Chinese entrepreneurs, famous people, and uh, Woon Wingyip is probably the most famous because he started up the Wingyip supermarket chain. He, uh, he arrived in Hull in 1959 with just two pounds in his pocket and worked and worked and worked. Starting up some of his own restaurants, but eventually realised there's more there's more money to be made in wholesale than in running a Chinese takeaway. So in '69 he founded the Wing Yip Supermarket, and it's become a massive, massive chain. So if you if you go to a Chinese British supermarket, uh, it's probably a Wing Yip. So of course he has been made a member, sorry, an officer of the Order of the British Empire. He's been given an O B E. So all those were kind of the most famous British Chinese people, and. More are arriving, as I say, due to these new security laws in Hong Kong. Uh, the British government uh, kind of opened up their policies um, to welcome more and more Hong Kongers to the UK. Um, and uh, according to an article in the Hong Kong Free Press, almost none of the Hong Kongers who emigrated to Britain since 2021 plan to return to the city. Um, even it, those who are finding it difficult to find their skills and qualifications put to good use in the UK, they're determined to stay. 99% plan to stay permanently. Uh, so Britain now has a new visa program for holders of, it's a British national overseas passport, so this is the passport held by Hong Kongers, and now it will become easier for them to become um, fully resident in the UK. It'll take five years to get um, that residence here in the UK, and a sixth will give them the route to full British citizenship. So it'll become more and more expanded, more and more Hong Kongers will be here. So we can expect more Cantonese food, more Chinese New Year celebrations, and more prominent Hong Kongers. So that was my uh, quick run around of Britain, China, connection. I hope that you enjoyed it. I read out from Lawrence James, The Rise and Fall of the British Empire. Niall Ferguson's Empire, How Britain Made the Modern World, and uh, didn't quite have time to read out uh, from Raymond Benson, 0 minus 10, but you can check out my full review on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed this, but if you have any questions, well, I've got six years of experience to draw upon, and I know quite a few experts who know even more than me, so do email me at albionneverdies at gmail.com, or message me on Instagram at Fleming Never Dies. Thank you very much for listening, I hope you enjoyed it.